just got to move through this slide deck. Um, these are things that kind of become inherent once you start um, doing cataract surgery and things like that, where you're kind of looking at, okay, how, how big is the eye? Um, when you look at the white to white measurement on the cornea, there's usually, you know, 11, 11 to 12 millimeters is kind of average. Um, at birth, the cornea is a little smaller. So you'll notice that if you're doing like a PK or something that you don't have as much room to sort of uh, trephinate or sorry, punch a, a cornea tissue to put onto your uh, graft. Um, the power of the cornea. So when you look at kind of the power of the cornea, the anterior cornea is actually a little bit steeper than you would expect. The posterior surface has some negative power. And so the average ends up being right around 43 to 44 on the power of the cornea. There's a bunch of corneal nerves that come in. They love to test that they're from the long posterior ciliary nerves. Epithelium, when you're doing PRK, you'll kind of realize it's between 50 and 60 microns thick. We do a pachymetry right before we start the surgery. And then once the epithelium's off, we do another pachymetry measurement. And that helps you kind of understand the thickness of the cornea and all the different layers. Um, most of the cornea is stroma. And so a majority of what you're dealing with in the cornea is that connective tissue, the collagen fibers of the cornea. Uh, they'd love to test that the basement membrane of the epithelium is type four collagen. That is not Bowman's layer. Um, so that's type four collagen for all basement membranes. Bowman's layer is actually type one collagen. So the key factor there is that it's not gonna stain with that PAS stain um, that you get with type four collagen. Stroma, again, it's mostly um, uh, water, actually, by weight. It's about 480 microns thick. So it's a majority of what you're dealing with on the cornea. Decimase membrane is one of those PAS positive membranes. It's type four collagen. So you think of it as a, a basement membrane for kind of the endothelial cells. Um, you have this banded kind of anterior layer and non-banded posterior layer. So those are kind of the different types or parts of the decimase membrane. Uh, most of it is pretty standard where it doesn't change with age at that banded layer, but then the adult kind of increases with age in thickness. Endothelium is a mono layer. Um, initially, it starts out with 3,500 to 4,000 cells. Uh, most of our transplant tissue ends up being about 22 to 2,600 cells. If you get a younger cornea, you'll sometimes hit that 3,000 cell mark. Uh, but these are, it's, it's essentially a monolayer of cells that does not regenerate. So there's no stem cells on the cornea um, as far as the endothelium goes. And so once you kill off endothelium, it continues to go down. So once, um, once a cell count kind of gets below about 1,000, is when you start worrying about uh, endothelial failure from any intraocular surgery, things like cataract surgery and things like that. All right, let's see. What can you guys actually see on my screen? I'm trying to, can you guys see all these boxes over here too? Yeah, it's just like the, your, like your desktop. It is my desktop. I can't get this to go to full screen mode. But all right. Okay. May All I right. ask a quick question? You said that um, it's under a thousand when there's a uh, failure uh, with surgery. And then if there's no surgery, it would be under 500 when there is a uh, failure. Is that correct? Yes, exactly. Yep. Yes, you'll start to see the, the swelling start to pick up once you get in this range. But yeah, below 500 is kind of the cutoff they use. But um, surgery, you expect to kill off a couple hundred cells. So. That's where that kind of comes from. That makes sense. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So the sclera, they love to test on the thinnest area. It's right underneath um, the rectus muscles. That becomes important when you're kind of dealing with an open glow blunt trauma injury. That's why you have to kind of look underneath those muscles is because that area is kind of the most likely to rupture. Um, it's made of type one collagen and it's pretty regular as far as its orientation. And that's why it ends up being pretty white in color. So again, just kind of reviewing the types of collagen, um, type one collagen, Bowman's membrane kind of falls in there. So don't get that confused that it's not a basement membrane. True basement membranes will always be type four collagen. 
All right, so this is a, a highly tested topic. Sorry, these are super small. I tried to put too much on this slide. We have follicles versus papillae and where they show up in different disease processes. Um, so in follicles, I kind of think of those kind of chronic follicular reactions um, that, that they come up in. So you can get them just with chronic, just plain old inflammation. So if an eye is just inflamed for a long time, you'll tend to see follicles show up, but you want to think about things like molluscum and HSV as viral causes. And then chlamydia is kind of a common cause um, of chronic conjunctivitis as well. Um, when you look at papillae, um, I think of more just, just kind of generic inflammation with bacterial infections. Allergies tend to get papillae, but sometimes you can get kind of a mixed reaction with allergy. Um, but you think of that giant papillary conjunctivitis as kind of the papillary the papillae that form on the upper eyelid. And then floppy eyelid syndrome is another common one where you get these large papillae happening. Um, you think of that as being when kind of an eyelid is almost getting rotated over and rubbing on a pillow at night. Um, and so you sort of get that inflammatory reaction there. So if it gets beyond four weeks, you start thinking about some of these things. Um, Again, I'm, I'm mostly thinking about chlamydia. I mean, there's, this is like some sort of mnemonic that I never could remember, but um, viral causes like HSV, keratitis, and chlamydia. And then molluscum. Um, I've had a couple of cases of molluscum causing chronic follicular conjunctivitis. And to me, the molluscum that I always saw were just like just tons of lesions in kids. And I didn't really ever see them in adults, um, but I've actually had a couple of adults. And I had one that was just like, this little tiny, probably about a millimeter and a half lesion on the upper lid. And I noticed it and asked the patient and she said, yeah, I've never seen that before. Now that I can, you show it to me, I can see, I can tell it's there. And Dr. Marks actually went and excised it and it was molluscum. So um, that comes up occasionally when you're, when you're sort of examining the lids, looking for causes of chronic follicles. Flick tenules are kind of weird things. Um, they tend to have kind of this white raised center with a lot of vascularity around them. Um, and they are most commonly bacterial causes um, are staph. You have to think about tuberculosis in endemic areas. Um, they typically respond well to just kind of topical steroids. So most of these patients, we treat them with like a maxitrol or um, tobramycin. Sometimes you'd separate out and get them a good antibiotic like a just even like polytrim or ofloxacin or something like that, and then do a topical steroid a few days later um, once you kind of get any bacterial stuff under control. But just make sure you're watching out for tuberculosis. So it's one of those things where it's like there's this systemic really bad disease that you have to watch out for. And so they love to show a picture of that and test, you know, what's a positive PPD and how much elevation do you have to have? Or what if somebody has been vaccinated? What, what kind of reaction are they gonna get from, from a, a PPD test. All right. <clears throat> so we do a whole lecture on degenerations of the cornea. Um, so these are essentially really common ones. I don't, they don't really test a whole lot on these. Conjugalasis comes up occasionally, pterygium maybe here and there, um, but not, not like a highly testable topic here. Hypersensitivity reactions, these are things you just have to know cold, you know, what type falls in, in which area. Um, Stevens-Johnson is a common one they test on with type 3, kind of the antibody antigen complex. Um, Flictenial, which we just talked about, is a type 4. Any granulomatous disease is typically a type 4, so like syphilis, tuberculosis can kind of lead to that. Uh, Stains will come up occasionally looking at, uh, you know, do they stain devitalized cells or do they stain actual disruptions in the intercellular junctions between fluorescein and these other two? Um, so atopic keratoconjunctivitis, um, really common thing that we see in Utah. Um, there's a couple of different reactions you see with this. You'll see a type 1 and a type 4, um, sometimes in combination. A lot of these patients will have symptoms year-round. Um, but when you have really bad atopic disease, it'll kind of flare up in the spring and fall with kind of the, um, with the seasonal changes. It's raining in California. How is that possible? All right, I got to go under a deck or something. 
<laughs> I'm gonna move over. Send that water this way. I know, I should, it should be coming, right? Let's see if this is any better. It's like a 40% chance of rain today. I'm like, that's better than any chance of moisture we've had in Utah for a month. All right, let's try this spot. Okay. So let's, since I switched seats, we're going to switch gears a little bit. We'll move over to, uh, we're going to do some test questions. So I'm going to get you guys involved a little bit here. All right, now we're better at full screen, right? Yeah. Okay, Lydia, I'm going to have you take this one on. So I want you to describe the picture for me. And this is a classic OCAP picture where it's super crappy. And you can't tell exactly what's going on. Okay, um, so this is a external photograph of the lower eyelid. The lower eyelid is inverted. And what I see when I look at this photograph is that instead of the regular smooth surface, there is an irregularity um, that looks like there could be like some elevations that are looking kind of round. What I'm trying to look out for is if there are vascular tufts in the center or not. Um, to be quite frank, it's very tough to tell on this photo. I saw it next to your folliculitis. So I suspect that the tufts are just on the, or like that there are no tufts, but that it's just around the base. But I would have a hard time telling it from that photograph. Um, it's just kind of pearly, right? They just look kind of pearly and elevated is the way I think of a follicular conjunctivitis. So I agree with you. Okay. So as we mentioned before, chronic inflammation um, would be what I put, would be thinking of and then ruling out all the causes we talked about previously. All right. So here's a question for you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Oh, I highlighted it. What the heck? What happened to my other slide? Oh, man, I'm failing you guys. My other slide got deleted somehow. All right. It's yeah, not but even Johnson gone. would be more sloughing and uh, less, say, folliculitis, correct? Yeah, so Stevens Johnson, um, when you think about that, you kind of expect to see kind of a membranous conjunctivitis in some cases, and then also um, symblephron, right? So those are kind of the two things that we worry about with Stevens Johnson. Once you start to see the membranes form, they'll start to stick together and cause those symblephron. So that's why you guys go after these with the glass rod or, or I, I used to use a scleral depressor where I would just kind of break up any adhesions that were in the, in the fornices of the eye um, in those Stevens Johnson patients. All right, good. Let's see. So again, chronic follicles, those are kind of the big ones you're thinking of. All right, let's see. Cole, you want to take this one on? Uh, probably four. All right, yeah, good method of injury. I'm sorry, I don't like to have test questions that are all of the following except because that's not a typical co or a OCAP format but but yeah so talk me through this a little bit um so basically if you have any sort of high pressure in the eye or issue with the red blood cell or the endothelium so kind of those first three pressure pushing blood cells up against the endo or sickled cells more likely to stain and then if the endothelium sick. Yeah, okay, perfect. All right, so method of injury doesn't matter. You just get blood in there, right? So it could be post-surgical, um, could be um, any kind of trauma. All right, Tony. One sec, I'm just reading it. Uh, between, let's see, two and three, um, uh, 
maybe maybe three mitomycin C therapy alone. All right. So what is CIN? Conjunctival um, uh, intraepithelial neoplasia. Okay, perfect. So we've got some sort of a, a lesion that's on the spectrum of cancer, right? It could it could be all the way from just mild atypia all the way to this is a squamous cell carcinoma potentially, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the best way to really treat this is probably to get the tissue off of the eye and send it to pathology. That's probably ideal. That's kind of textbook. Okay, we got to figure out what this is. Um, mm -hmm. That's not necessarily true um, in today's world. And most commonly, what we would like to do is actually treat these. They, they respond best to interferon um, topically or sometimes injected. So that would be kind of the treatment of choice probably today. So the second option would be um, wide local excision with cryotherapy. So when you do mitomycin C um, doesn't work quite as well for CIN. Um, you'll sometimes use mitomycin C topically after removing like a pigmented lesion um, like even in melanoma therapy. So you'd kind of remove a melanoma and then sometimes use topical mitomycin C. Um, wide local excision, I think is the correct answer here. Um, cryotherapy is kind of the key part to essentially say, okay, I'm going to remove everything that I can see surgically, and I'm going to give myself some margins. Um, and then with cryo, you essentially are going to kill off any cells around the edges of your um, surgical bed where you essentially freeze the tissue and then let it thaw and you go all the way around and then you do it a second time. So that's that double freeze thaw technique on, on cryotherapy. Okay? I actually have this question as well, which of these are true except for. Oh, no, 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 you're good, you're good. So yeah, the key is if you do simple excision with this, that's the wrong answer. And you'll have ophthalmologists that do that because they don't have a cryo. Um, and then the better sort of topical chemotherapy is interferon. So those are kind of the keys to this one. All right, good. Okay, I showed you a picture of this, Sean. Softball, unless you were, had got on later. Flictenual. All right. <laughs> you like that identification of a flictenual. Okay, so what type of hypersensitivity reaction is a flictenual? Oh, this is going to be embarrassing. Uh, what, didn't didn't we say it was a type four hypersensitivity? You got reaction? it. Yeah. yeah. All right, type four it is. Yeah. All right, Sean, you win. What's the systemic disease you have to watch out for? TB. Yeah, tuberculosis. What if a patient had been vaccinated against tuberculosis? How would you test them? Uh. Uh. I don't know. Quant does quantifier not work anymore? I think I know the BCG will will still right. will be reactive, but yeah, I I was thinking quantifier on gold because I think okay. that the PPD will do weird stuff. I can't remember the details of it though. Somebody I might have, have to yeah, the, might have yeah. to just but okay. So type four, you got this kind of ulcerated apex, which is why it's kind of white in the center, and then the redness around the side really commonly seen in kids for whatever reason. So kids get these a lot and it's most likely that staph sort of uh, bacteria that's causing it. Do these usually like kind of spill over onto the cornea from the limbus or are they usually more just straight on the conch like that? They're more like the bottom picture than the top picture, um, okay. but you can see them where they're just right at, up against the cornea. And usually the corneal sort of findings are uh, more likely to be like a delin type okay. thing, so. Question. Um, yeah. Is it hard to tell the difference between a flictenual, like on the bottom picture, and like a nodular scleritis? Or um, it can be. Um, yeah, for sure. That would kind of be your differential. And is um, you can tell by trying to move it around and see which layer it's in? Usually, nodular scleritis is much deeper. Um, yes. So that would be a, one key thing. You could try using like a phenylephrine drop to see if that changes the, the vascularity of it. These ones that are kind of really superficially injected, sometimes that phenylephrine won't get rid of all of it. Um, but you could still kind of tell if it's deeper, kind of coming from the sclera instead of the conjunctiva. Yeah. 
but it can be hard to tell. That's for sure. All right, Tyler. I haven't seen Tyler chime in, so he might not be available. Totally. I think Tyler's on consult right now. I can go. Oh, you're good. This. Brandon, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so external photograph looks like it's a superior ulceration, um, not at the limits, but also. So I would suspect some type of either trauma or shield ulcer, like GPC. Um, but I don't really see a large infiltrate, so it doesn't look uh, too infectious to me or anything like that. Okay, good. What kind of trauma would you be thinking of here? Is there anything like specific? Um, honestly, no. Upper, upper part of the cornea has like an epi defect or abrasion. Like uh, if you have like intra, not intraocular, but foreign body within your lid, you to make sure that, yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a, that's a big key thing. So if you ever see something on the upper cornea that's kind of abraded, that's not commonly going to get hit by somebody, right? A finger or something hitting their eye. Because most people will have that upward bells reaction. And so the injuries are always to the lower cornea. Um, some people do have a downward bells when they get an injury or something coming at them. So you can get that. But, but most commonly you would think of there's something on the upper lid. And that's kind of the pathology here is that there's something on the upper lid. All right. So what's the cause of this finding? I would say vernal with a shield ulcer. Yeah. Yeah, so the history is going to help you, right? So the history of this patient is I've had allergies. And so the vernal keratoconjunctivitis, the VKC, comes up. If the history was different, it could be any of these things, right? So if it's like, gosh, nothing happened to my eye and I just uh, – woke up and it was feeling fine. And then as the day went on, it started to just hurt more and more. Um, you might think, oh, this could be herpes simplex coming on. Um, if it was more of trauma, like you said, I was out weed whacking and got something in my eye. It felt a little bit weird that day, but now it really hurts. Could be that there's something underneath that upper lid with the number four. Um, recurrent erosions, Brandon, how do those usually present? So Lots of times these patients will have recurrent erosions. Typically they'll have one. Um, I know it's common for those patients to have EPMD. Um, in regards to how they present, typically they'll heal and then overnight they'll, their eyelid will kind of stick to their epithelium. Then they'll re-slough off their epithelium and wake up with a ton of pain. Good. So they're just causing abrasions every time that lid kind of sticks to the cornea. Um, anybody know the mechanism of action of that? overnight issue why is having your lid closed such a problem isn't it that like suction or hydraulic effect on the cornea or on the epithelium yeah so what happens is when you sleep at night with the lid kind of closed over the cornea the cornea actually retains more fluid and so it gets swollen and so the epithelium becomes a little bit more loosely attached um, with the stroma swelling and so you end up with kind of a situation where that skin's a little looser yeah, and it's just a tug of war every night where the lid and the cornea are kind of fighting. And in most cases, the cornea wins that tug of war. But when somebody has looser skin, then um, the, the lid can sometimes win that. So good. All right. Uh, VKC. So it has a little bit of a type one, but mostly type four reaction. Um, typically, once you get these people into puberty, like uh, 10, 11, 12, this starts to go away. So that's kind of something that I usually tell them to look forward to is that it usually gets better. Um, with a lot of these patients now, I try to get them into an allergist pretty early um, because I think they've, they've come a long ways in treating allergic conjunctivitis um, and vernal conjunctivitis with, with shots, like allergy shots. They can usually find something that's causing the inflammation and treat it. All right, should we go back to the, who's at the top? Back to Lydia. Yep. Um, so this is an external photograph of uh, both eyes and looking, uh, looking at it, the upper eyelid is pulled up and it looks like there is um, a mass 
possibly underneath the um, upper eyelid. And I think I would be concerned for, I, I wonder if this looks like salmon. I, I haven't seen enough of those. Like, I think I'm always thinking of like lymphoid tumors that look like salmon patches or things in the lacrimal gland, because that's the area where um, there could be an effect. Um, of course, also like foreign bodies would be possible. It's a, um, but yeah, that's kind of. All right. So that, that yeah. what you're seeing there in this crappy photo is that is his lacrimal gland. Okay. And it's pretty normal in size. So what do you think about his lid? The lid is very floppy. Very floppy, right? Okay, good. Let's see. Um, I would suspect sleep apnea. All right, so what does he have? Um, well, he has floppy eyelid syndrome. Okay, perfect. Yeah, if you try to do that to your lid, like you can't, I can't see my lacrimal gland when I do that, right? I no. mean, that lid is crazy floppy. So as ophthalmologists, sometimes we, um, we don't ever touch our patients, right? So get in the habit of kind of touching your patients and the fact of just lift that upper lid, lift that lower lid, just kind of get a feel for what their lid position is like. And sometimes you'll, you'll clue into why their eyes are chronically red or, or what's going on with them. Sleep apnea can kill people. It can cause heart problems. It can cause um, chronic brain injury type issues where they are essentially hypoxic overnight. So they love to test you on things that correlate with that. And it's interesting to have those conversations with patients too. It's like, you might have sleep apnea. Your lids are pretty, uh, pretty floppy. Maybe get that checked out. Um, kind of a weird appearance that you'll get to the, um, the palpebral conjunctiva where it becomes like this super smooth red appearance. In a lot of cases, you'll see like giant papillary conjunctivitis, but sometimes it's just this beefy red <clears throat> relatively flat looking inflammation on that uh, lid from rubbing all night. Um, I deal with patients that have keratoconus a lot and keratoconus is a common finding in floppy eyelid syndrome. Um, a lot of these people tend to be overweight, not always, but um, their heads tend to have a little extra weight to them and they like to sleep on their face for some reason. I don't know why that's the most comfortable position, but that the weight of their head on their eye can cause, um, changes in the shape of their cornea with keratoconus. So um, essentially the treatment is lubricate like crazy. If that doesn't help, then sometimes you'll do a wedge resection surgery with the uh, oculoplastics kind of shortening the, the lid tends to elongate in the sort of horizontal plane. And that's why you get the floppiness of the lid. Okay, so we're gonna shift gears again. Let's see, it's 6.30. Let's try something here that I've never tried. I'm gonna stop sharing. So what we're gonna do, one, two, three, four, five. So we're only gonna have two groups, but we're gonna, I'm gonna put you into breakout rooms just for like five minutes. And I want you to come up with a test question. Um, let's see. So we're gonna do a test question on keratoconus and one on Fuchs endothelial dystrophy. So those are kind of the two topics. Um, breakout room one, we'll do the keratoconus and breakout room two, we'll do Fuchs endothelial dystrophy. So you're gonna come up together with a, a test question, just a multiple choice question that you can then quiz us on and then teach us a little bit about your question. So let's try it. Looks like we have Cole and Tony in room one and Lydia and Sean in room two. Questions? And Marianne, Marian Eye Center is me, Jordan. Oh, Jordan, you're in it too? I don't know how to put you in a room. I don't think I can put you in a room. I might have to just choose. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, so I'm gonna open the rooms and let's see what happens. Let's see, Brandon, how do I put you in a room? No, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm going to sign you. There you go. Now you can go into room one. Yeah, Jordan, I don't, I don't know if I can get you into a room. Yeah, I think with the with the host privileges, I don't I don't know if I can even put myself in a room. <laughs> All right, so let's let's come up with one. Yeah, I don't want to put the host in a room because then I think it it might do something weird to the meeting. 
let's see. What do you want to learn about? Do you want to do, why don't we do one on recurrent erosions? Let's come up with a test question for that. Um, let's see. You know anything about them? Um, not particularly other than what was just kind of discussed. I actually don't even know what the acronym that um, Brandon was referring to, like the uh, MBPB. Yeah, so you have EBMD or ABMD, or those, those two refer to anterior basement membrane dystrophy or epithelial basement membrane dystrophy. Okay, gotcha. Um, where you essentially have duplication of the epithelium and it causes the skin to, it tends to cause the skin to be loose. And so you're more prone to recurrent erosions with that disease. And then it causes kind of irregular astigmatism and patients wake up with pain. Um, so I guess let's think about this. So do you know the treatment for recurrent erosions? Um, I would imagine um, that it would start, like if it was mild, it would start with kind of like surface lubrication, um, like topical emollients. And then if that didn't work, um, potentially, um, like going towards like, uh, amniotic membrane or, um, like that, like bandage contact lens, like some sort of like protective issue or thing, or would also like a scrape, do you do like an epithelial scrape ever and like with a diamond burr or something and just try to get it to like re-epithelialize on a yeah that's more, like on a rougher surface yep so you essentially lubricate like crazy so drops ointment um sometimes a really effective medication is um muro or sodium chloride mm, okay and it helps dehydrate the epithelium to sort of try to keep the stroma a little bit tighter um attached to the epithelium and then plugs, so punctal plugs. So those are kind of the full court press on lubricating. And then um, if they keep happening, then you would do, I think a bandage lens, sometimes with an amniotic membrane um, would be good. And then from there, you have to go on to surgical options. So you have superficial keratectomy with diamond burr polishing, yep. And then another option is um, PTK is phototherapeutic keratectomy so you do prk essentially mm -hmm. on the cornea so remove the epithelium do a small laser and then let it heal back those those two are, des are designed to try to create scars so that the skin heals more tightly oh and, and then if it's off center is it if it's like not center involved then you can also do like a can you do like a 25 gauge needle just trying to like puncture bowman's membrane and just try to get like a little reactive scar right there as well Yep. So they call that stromal micropuncture. Stromal micropuncture. Okay. Yeah, perfect. All right. Can you come up with a test question with all that info? <laughs> um, I guess, um, I think like, uh, what is a good like surgical management option for center visual axis involving recurrent erosion after you have already, after like aggressive lubrication has failed? Perfect. I like it. Okay. What options do you want to give them? Um, so I would give them superficial um, keratectomy um, with diamond burr. I would give them also uh, the 25, I would give them uh, the needle. Um, the stromal micropuncture. The stromal micropuncture, because you wouldn't want to do that if that was center involving. Perfect. Um, I can give them. Give them like a PK. Okay. Yeah. PK. That would be crazy. Yeah. Um, how about LASIK? Okay. All right. That works. All right. Okay. Yeah. All right. I told them they could have five more minutes. So they've got four left. So we'll see. Uh... I, I actually think I could sneak into a room. Should I sneak into a room? Let's see what's going on. <laughs> Just drop it. <laughs> says I can join them, but yeah, I don't even have the option to join, which is how's Disney? <laughs> oh, I don't enjoy Disneyland, but that's okay.
I'm the same way. I, uh, all the, the ride heights were always like six, nine and I'm like six, seven. And I just wonder exactly how tight their tolerances are. I would imagine they're, they're, there's probably a fair bit of breathing room, but <laughs> they have a height limit on their rides. I'd never thought about that. A lot of them. Yeah. That's yeah, interesting. I don't know if it's for the head or for the knees. I hope it's not for the head, but <laughs> yeah, I'm assuming it's for the legs, <laughs> kind of a tight, tight squeeze in those things. We did get to see the uh, Super Bowl parade. Oh, really? Nice. Yeah, so they had uh, Aaron Donald and Matthew Stafford and uh, Cooper Cup on a little float down Main Street yesterday. Then it looked like they did like a live something or other. So they interviewed him and were shooting something by the castle. So it was kind of cool to see him. That was awesome. I didn't even watch the Super Bowl this year. <laughs> no, no, just that was a good one. I heard. I feel like every game, like every playoff game, was just really good. Like the whole playoffs were awesome. They were like just tight games. Anybody could have won them. <clears throat> Pulls back. Yeah, we were we were just chatting about life. So. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Lydia and Sean might be uh, really into this, so I have to give them their, their three minutes. Two minutes? What do we got left? Yeah, two minutes. We also didn't know we could leave the room, so I wonder if they're just waiting. <laughs> I'll go over there and talk. I'll go see what they're doing. I'll be back. If you, get, if you guys ski Brighton this weekend, look for my phone. <laughs> um, did you get a new one? Or are you on your laptop still? So? I'm in my laptop. It's, it should be in the mail, but it hasn't shipped yet. Wait, what happened to your phone? It's on the last run of the day at Brighton off of Snake Creek. Like no. Right, right into the trees on the left. It's somewhere. And that's the problem. It like wasn't a main run. Yeah. So I, can, I can see it on Find My iPhone, but I can't find it. <laughs> Yeah, I did. I did the same too. With I just lost my phone in the snow once, and you can never find it again. Yeah, yeah. dude, there's definitely like a 14 year old park rat in a triple X tall tee chop shopping your phone right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I locked it. There, there was also at Brighton on Saturday. There was a DJ who was 11 years old. Wow, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> DJ Q. Jordan, I'm thinking about going up tomorrow to Park City after uh, in the evening. Oh, yeah. I've been get some skinny in. I think Brandon might join too. Dude, I might join. I'd be down. Cool. Brandon, were you talking with Jacob yesterday? Because he said he was at that uh, hole in one at the waste management open. Yeah, dude, that's insane. He said it was like his, one of his top five sports moments ever. Yeah, yeah. He's like, I don't really even like golf that much, but I'm like, that would have been like the highlight of my life. Yeah. <laughs> it's insane. And then they all threw the, all their drinks on the green. He said he definitely threw one. Yeah, that's awesome. That's crazy. I would love to go to that that tournament. It'd be fun. I think you were muted, Doug Zag. I'm not sure if you were trying to say something. Oh, I bet it's the same temperature here as Utah. Fifty-five wow. degrees. That's too cold for California. I know it's not going to get out of the fifties today. It's you guys going to... into the the park today? Yeah. Yeah, um, kind of perfect because it's not too hot. So, yeah. All right, I'm going to put the intern on the spot. Jordan's going to give you our question first. I helped him because he couldn't get into a breakout room. So, all right. So, this question is relating to recurrent epithelial erosions. 
and the surgical management thereof. So if you have a center involving recurrent epithelial erosion, the appropriate surgical management is either one, PK, two, stromal micropuncture, three, superficial keratectomy with a diamond burr, or four, LASIK surgery. All right, Sean, why don't you take that one on? Well, I think a PK would be a little bit uh, extreme. We don't want to go there quite yet. I think that LASIK would probably be a poor option at this point. Um, micropuncture, I feel like, is something that that may, maybe could be considered, but I think the first line would be a superficial keratectomy. Uh, yeah. All right, Jordan, what, what distinguished those two answers in your question? Uh, just the center involving. So if it's more peripheral, you can do stromal micropuncture. Okay. You puncture Bowman's membrane, you have some reactive You'll get scarring, scarring there. there. Yeah. Yeah, so if it's within the pupil, um, you don't want to do the stromal micropuncture. You know, what does that mean? Is it, you know, the central three millimeters, the central four, the central five? I'm pretty conservative about it because I think superficial keratectomy works really well. And so um, I, I don't do stromal micropuncture all that much unless it's pretty obvious that it's peripheral. So, and you'll get some of these patients that have kind of chronic um, bolus keratopathy kind of on a different topic where um, they're getting these recurrent erosions or bole is kind of more of what they're getting. And sometimes stromal micropuncture can work for them. And if they don't have good vision potential, then sometimes I'll do it in the center. But for the most part, stromal micropuncture is a peripheral corneal treatment. If they were okay. a candidate, could you just do PRK? Yes. So what do we call it if it's uh, PRK for recurrent erosions? So it has a different name. Photo, phototherapeutic. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. So PTK. So PRK is photorefractive. Um, so we're doing it solely for the refractive outcome. And then um, PTK is a therapeutic um, purpose. And insurance will pay for that. So kind of a twofer for, for those patients. Okay. Let's see. Breakout room one. That was uh, Cole and Tony. I'm and Brandon. Brandon. Yep. I'm going to share our screen because we're academics. All right. Let's see. Who's going to, let's do, I, I have to do Lydia since Sean just took that one. Uh, that's a tough one. <laughs> um, oh my goodness. So, I'm wondering if this is a horizontal line um, that is kind of in the, um, so I'm looking for, for forked uh, lines, basically like horizontal lines in the uh, indecimase that would break as the cornea, uh, keratoconus progresses and then could cause uh, acute uh, high drops and decompensation. So I think I'm gonna go with a uh, rogue line all right, can, can you see the question, Lydia? I, Cole, we got that. We got oh, it. iron line is seen. Oh, <laughs> I, oh my goodness. Uh, the iron line, there is an iron line in the on the base of the uh, cratoconus, and I believe that is called, I know, I know they're like different iron lines and I'm throwing them all together. I think it was fairy line that was, or was it a fly, the fly shoring? Yeah, there you go. All right, now you're now you're on OCAPS and you're like, crap. Is it A or C? It's one of the F's, but I can't remember which one it is. Uh, yeah. Okay. Guys are fleishering. We Fleisher. followed up. Nice. We followed up with this too. Maybe Sean can do that. Hey, hold on. Did we just say that this is a Fleischer ring? <clears throat> yep. Yeah. Not to be confused with a Kaiser Fleischer. That's the same. Yeah, Kaiser Fleischer ring. Oh, Kaiser, Kaiser Fletcher, right, 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 okay, yeah. all right. Uh, what conditions, with, which conditions are each of the other iron lines seen with? Now you have to answer four questions when Lydia only had to answer one. Uh, so where do you see a fairy line? I don't know the answer to these. I don't know any of these answers. 
I can walk us through them. Yeah, go ahead. So ferry line, I have stupid like little thought processes for these. So ferry line, I think of like boats and I think of like a bleb, like sitting on water. So ferry lines like right underneath the bleb. Hudson Stolly. Um, I just think of this as like a, the Hudson Stolly River. So this is like an older people, their tier meniscus line. Eventually as you age, you just get that like horizontal iron line um like the inferior one third and then the last one stocker line um i don't really have a mnemonic for that or a thought process i just remember that's the other one which is associated with pterygiums at the leading edge i think pterygiums are pretty stocky and they're just marching in yeah I think, I think of them creeping you know like a pterygium is like a slowly creeping growth like a stalker would do yeah and then lydia was going for the vote strie which is kind of these uh B for vertical lines um, that are super tiny and small, um, right in the central cornea. Somebody gonna teach us more? Uh, this this is just from your presentation I screenshot last year. So <laughs> nice. nice. I feel like this is pretty high yield. Yeah. So you, these are the, the the issue with these kind of diseases is that you have to know everything about them and every association. Because they're the big ones. They're the things that we're seeing on a, an everyday basis. And so you just have to know them all. So. And my mnemonic for the Hudson Stalin line, it's that uh, I always think of Stalin and think that he's old. <laughs> anyway, that's how I remember it. Yeah. yeah. He's very, very old, right? <laughs> One of the things about high drops, I just want to point out um, real quick, is that a lot of the treatment now could entail probably it could be first line potentially is um, an anterior chamber gas fill so kind of fill the anterior chamber with air it sort of tries to reattach um, decimase membrane in the endothelium so that you get a little bit quicker resolution of the high drops so that's something to know is that that answer will come up more commonly now all right lydia and sean all right, so our question um, is about uh, Fuchs endothelial dystrophy. And the question is about cornea guttata. Do they start peripherally and spread centrally? Or do they start centrally and spread peripherally? Do they appear across the entire cornea? Or do they only appear after endothelial decompensation? Uh, Tony? Um. I have a feeling they might start peripherally and move centrally, but I'm not okay. too sure. So. Okay. You're kind of between two, maybe. One of the good test taking strategies is if two questions look the same, but there's one thing that's different about them, right? That's probably your answer. One of those two, because they're trying to, trying to fool you. What do you think, yeah. Lydia? Um, it's central. Not it starts centrally and then spreads peripherally. Yeah. So there's another type of guttata that we see that we don't really associate with books. And what are those? Those are the oh, ones Hassel, that you have Hassel Henley. Yep. Hassel Henley. Are they call them warts? I'm trying to remember now. Hassel Henley bodies? Yes, bodies. I can't remember what this term is, but those are, you'll see them. Most old people will have uh, guttata kind of in their peripheral cornea. So that's one way to kind of distinguish it. And, and Fuchs really is a visually significant problem. And so if it's in the center of your view, um, that's, that's when it's a problem. And so just think of Fuchs as causing vision problems. And that will kind of help you remember that. Um, let's see. Trying to get to this. And I guess I didn't realize I could share my screen a little different. Let's try this. Is that more full screen? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so Fuchs dystrophy, it's typically starting to show up after age 50. Um, that's when they're going to start to have problems with it. It's more commonly um, affecting women than men. 
And so you'll, you'll have a lot of, I actually have a fair number of middle-aged females that have a strong family history of Fuchs that have had problems with it. So I've done endothelial keratoplasty. I've done it on three now um, patients in their forties. I actually met a patient who was transferred to me that had it in her late twenties um, that it was bad enough. So it's these guttata, they're, they're part of Decimase membrane. So it's kind of this thickened collagen on Decimase membrane that pops out. And um, structurally, you can imagine how that would sort of affect the endothelial cells, which is this monolayer of cells. So these little bumps are now kind of pushing on those and creating disruption in them. And so you end up with a loss of endothelial cells. And so as the endothelial cell count gets lower and lower, um, the cells kind of enlarge and they try to fill it in. So you get these really weird shaped and large endothelial cells that you'll see. And eventually they start to lose their function and you get swelling in the cornea. I guess I only have one slide on, oh. Oh, well, he's gone. California time starting. Kind of go to Disney World. Yeah. He seemed to realize it right before it happened. His computer probably he, died. He went, oh. <laughs> is this just an hour long lecture? Yeah, it is. And I think we're probably pretty much done. Oh, Mace coming back. Never mind. Can we get out of here. Oh, uh, here he is. I think my computer just died. So uh, we thought you were leaving to go to, to Disneyland. That was a good time, though. I think I was done. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think the way that I sort of studied for OCAPS is I would look at pretty much every disease and just try to think in my mind, okay, if I was writing a question about this, what would I ask? How would I ask it? And I think that that when you get into sort of this test question writing mode, you start to learn a little bit more about, you know, how hard it is sometimes to write good questions and, and how you have to have to sort of stick to the basics in most cases. And so um, writing questions is a helpful way to actually study for OCAPS because you can start to learn what the test writers are actually thinking about. I know Dr. Lin actually writes for OCAPS um, or maybe for boards, one of the two. And so um, her lectures would be good at sort of, sort of understanding her thought process on how to write questions too. But um, cornea is a fun one. I actually didn't ever do very well on cornea on the OCAPS, um, which might be the reason that I went into it is because I thought this is a really challenging um, field. And so I think it's gonna keep me interested in trying to come up with all the all the weird things that patients come in with. Any last thoughts or questions before I let you go on with your day? If not, I will leave you to Utah. Have a good day. Everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right.